I love fishing. I thought about fishing when I'd go to bed at night. It's kind of like, you know, just hearing the sound of the water, just kind of gently hitting the rocks and the breeze on your face, and you just, you feel free. It's, it feels like freedom. So, yeah, I would think about that when I was, uh, when I was in prison quite frequently. My dad got me into it, my brothers fish. It's something we do as a family, so it reminds me of them too. This gives me a time to reflect on choices, good and bad, and plan for the future. All right, Jim. I right, will see you That's later. All. all right, thanks. Yep. I have been to Cook County Jail 17 times. I've been to prison three times. I'm characterized as a chronic relapser as far as addiction goes, and this has been ongoing since I was like 19, and I'm gonna be 39 next week. Tight quarters. Home sweet home. In the beginning, it was extremely hard. I would get a couple months clean, and then I would go do something stupid and get arrested, and then back to jail, and then back to prison. That's why I'm in a halfway house right now. Phoenix House is a recovery home. It's a structured environment for you to kind of restart your life and get back on your feet. You're able to live here if you're drug free, you've come out of some kind of institution, be it rehab, be it jail or prison. It's people that are trying to change their lives and, and do something different with them. When you start off here, you're in a two man room. And then as you complete things and you move up, you eventually get into your own room kind of preparing us to be like normal people. Because I mean, when you're in jail or prison, you could sleep all day if you want to. I mean, this is not something that you can do here. It's not a flop house. It's not a shelter. It's not just the roof. It's an actual program that has structure and, and rules behind it. Some of the rules are not leaving any electronics on in your room. If your bed's not made before 8 a.m., if your door is shut. If you break a rule, uh, say you leave garbage in your garbage can, you'll get a behavior modification where you'll have to go to a meeting. And they're, they're not giant, it's not giant things, you know, but in the beginning, coming in in the beginning, it's a big deal. Maury? Really? No, like All right, my well, teeth got to come out. Part of the celiac, you're, you get a calcium deficiency, so normally people break bones or they'll lose yeah. their teeth. Well, I lost my teeth. I had an underlying health issue with a celiac disease I, I wasn't aware of until I turned 33, so that was a few years ago. In order to eat, I gotta take them out, but it totally changes the structure of my face. And if I went in a job, trying to do an interview with no teeth, don't I look completely different? Yeah. Parents got divorced when I was eight. My mom died when I was 10. 
I moved back in with my father after that. He worked blue collar job, worked for ComEd for a long time. Um, my siblings had a big hand in me being raised. High school is kind of a pivotal point of everything with the addiction starting. I was on wrestling, I did sports, and it was like the prelude to uh, college, you know, so we thought. Started smoking weed a lot. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot. My dentist's office was right across the street and that's kind of uh, what led me into the opiates with the amount of painkillers that I was getting for all the dental work that I had done, not knowing that that was part of celiac disease. So, I mean, everything really started right here. After a while, I got uh, cut off from the painkillers from the dentist because they probably, I think they observed that there was an issue. I started buying them off the street and I got tricked into my first bag of heroin because I thought it was a crushed up prescription pill. And I decided I loved that and I would run with that. I wound up going to rehab for the first time at 19 and it just kept happening over and over and over. I was in bad shape. I was doing like 26 bags of heroin a day at the time. I was living with my dad. And I stole his truck and went and bought drugs and all that stuff and pawned his laptop. Then he kicked me out of the house. I was like, I must need to go to prison because I hadn't been to prison at this point, but I've been to jail quite a few times. And I just didn't know how to stop or what could help me. So I thought going to prison would stop it, you know? And I, uh, I went into Home Depot and I stole something and I stood outside and I literally rolled a cigarette and sat there and smoked it until they realized what I had done to come out and grab me, which was, you know, quite a while. You know, so I could have got away with that, but I was ready just to get put somewhere. And um, that's the first time I went to prison. I love dancing. I was dancing when I was a little kid, and it's something I haven't done in a very long time. I never would have thought of using that kind of dancing as a therapy or a treatment for someone in recovery. But they do have sober dances and things like that to show you you can still have fun without getting drunk or high. And to have that in an actual part of your treatment makes all the difference in the world. When I walked into Above and Beyond, I didn't know what to expect. I'm used to going into a place for treatment where it's very institutional. When I walked in here, everyone had smiles. They were very friendly. The other thing that I found out after I did my assessment was that we pick our own classes. So they give us options of what to pick is pretty awesome. It's not your textbook therapy that you're getting there. You're getting more of a customized therapy session for each individual person. You gotta focus on the body, the mind, and the soul. 
dancing helps out with a lot of the physical aspect of it with the correct way to stretch and physical activities increase endorphins. So uh, that affects the chemical makeup and it's all encompassing. Being here, getting the treatment for the mental stuff, you know, the mind, the body is taken care of and I have a renewed sense of self and hope. Liz is my girlfriend. We actually met six years ago. She was in a recovery home at the time and she was sober and I was sober. And uh, we've been together four years now. Yeah. <laughs> Jim said he's gonna take me Sunday up to the storage unit right. so I can get uh, the suit for graduation in the, co in the coffee pot. Oh, the suit. Yeah. Right. It's riskier to be in a relationship in early sobriety because if one of you relapses, the other one might go with you. But on the same note, you both kind of understand what the other person's going through. She had a cat that her son used to feed, and then the cat had kittens, and those kittens had kittens. And I thought, should she relapse or should I relapse? We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. All right, I'll see you. All right, All right love, love you. Love you. Love you, too. I can't look too far ahead into the future because it's never worked before. I just got to grab some connectors. I went to prison last time for retail theft. At the time, I was homeless, living in a car, addiction problem, and I was stealing to support my habit and just kind of survive. Ready? Yeah. Right here at this intersection is the first place I ever got arrested. My first felony, right here. Cops pulled up and they were like, drew their guns. They're like, get out of the car. I didn't grow up and say, I'm going to be a criminal with a drug addiction problem. That wasn't my goal. Yeah, just roll up your windows and get that last box. When I would get out of prison and I'd be doing good and everything, and by good, I mean not using and getting towards being self-sufficient. Okay. You start hitting all these roadblocks with getting an apartment, with getting a better paying job, with trying to do the things that normal people would do. It's a struggle. Trying to pursue those things and keep getting shot down because of your background, it's very depressing. And then you just kind of get to the point where you say, F it. You just continue to hurt yourself and everybody else around you. How's that look, Jim? Good. I started going to Above and Beyond for classes, and yeah. I was introduced to Jim, who is the maintenance guy at Above and Beyond. And he was telling me how he had a few projects around there, and I was just kind of like, yeah, cool, I can no. help you out. The biggest, the biggest level you got. You got a four-foot level. He's the good guy. He actually cares about what he's doing and where he's at. It helps him get his stuff done there. It helps me work and use my hands, which makes me feel like more of a human being. And a little bit of money to support myself while I'm in the halfway house. So all this is going to come out, and then it's just going to be reframed it's not the right door height. You can see where we got the different markings for header, door, and beam. I'll survive off of doing jobs like this, but I need something that's not only full-time, but with benefits. Insurance, pension, things for when I can't do this work anymore. I mean, I'm in shape now, but I'm not going to be for another, you know, Another 20 years, I won't be able to do this. My hands won't take it. You know, my body just, I can't do this work forever. So I need something where uh, I can get into a union or, you know, like work for the CTA 
or something where I can use my skills and I can have some kind of long-term stability. That's super hard with having any kind of background. So then what do you do in the meantime? You know, you do jobs like this. I have to get the record sealed or expunged. Whatever I got a conviction for, I can get sealed. Whatever got thrown out, I can get expunged like it never happened. But it's a process. It's not something that just happens overnight. When you come out after you've done your time and you've paid for the crime that you committed, for it to stick with you for the rest of your life, it's like having a scarlet letter. I'd like to have a family, and I would just hate to be applying to a preschool and my kid gets denied because I was in prison. Hi. I'm trying to get my rap sheet. What do I have to do for that? Yes, sir, that would be done in records, that office right there. But to get the rap sheet, you need to be fingerprinted. Okay. Unfortunately, fingerprinting, they only do fingerprinting Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays. OK. All right. Oh. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. See you tomorrow. <laughs> it's definitely a sacrifice to come and do this. It means I got to take more time off of work, which I might not be able to. It means that I might miss uh, the lease or the apartment that I'm going for because I can't get the record taken care of. So it completely jeopardizes and pushes your timeline out. I just got to keep making accommodations and rolling with the punches. I don't have a driver's license right now because I have a bunch of fines to pay off to get my license back. I think I need something like 3000 or something. So that's quite a lot of money when you have nothing and you're trying to start over. I don't have keys for the house anymore. My family took those away a long time ago. So I had to uh, call my brother and let him know. I uh, came to get stuff out of my truck to let me park my truck here while I'm in the halfway house. And it's uh, high tension time. What? With going to prison and using, I Manipulated a lot of my family, manipulated situations. Anytime I would, you know, come into the house, I would have tried to take something that I could sell to get money. So now, you know, I'm, I'm pretty much watched while I'm in the house, period. Uh, and I, I'm OK with that. I mean, I understand why. I'd probably do the same. I would do the same thing if I were in their shoes. The unfortunate thing is I, I hurt my family very badly, and they're very uh, cautious about me being around. But they still love me, and I still love them. It's just going to take time. It's a lot of pain looking at all this stuff. It's a memory of a lot of bad choices. I feel lucky knowing that I haven't lost absolutely everything, which is normally what goes with, you know, going to jail or going into recovery. You usually walk in with absolutely nothing to your name. All the things that mean something to you are gone. Coming back and opening up the truck, I see that I, I have a lot of work to do, getting rid of stuff, cleaning it up. It's like the story of my life. I have a lot of work to do to make things right.
Hey. What's going on, bud? Because it's you. Yeah. I got your saw. I met Sean and Maddie about four years ago. I was actually in treatment with Sean. It was a lot of helping him out, get back on his feet, and now the table's kind of turned, and he's in the position where he's helping me out, getting me on my feet. So it's uh, it's huge to have somebody like that in your life, knows exactly where you're coming from, and willing to still be there to help you. What are they? Uh, oh, the for pumpkin. the pumpkin carving. Remember when we were doing the campfire uh, festival? Yeah. For some reason, they like having me around. You know, I haven't figured that out yet, but. It gives me a sense of that normal feeling people would have with family. So what's been going on with you and Liz? You know, this is her, her first experience with, you know, going through anything like I've been through so many times. So she's doing, uh, she's doing really well on that. And she's actually gone and I've had more independence myself. Because I remember that was the first thing when we got together. I'm like, I can't get away. I'm happy you guys are trying to do this together, but both of you need to realize that you need independence and recovery and not this unhealthy codependence that you developed as drug buddies. Like, let's be honest. Yeah. How many times have you done this of going through? You know, the revolving re door of rehab, jail, rehab, prison, rehab. And going to AA and getting a sponsor and even working the whole 12 steps, et cetera. What's happened whenever I've slipped up in the past immediately, we have some conversation and the question is, what am I gonna do different this time, right? Because whatever I did that last time didn't work, so. Uh, I, what's different, so the work thing, you know, not overloading myself with trying to just get any little thing that I can is one aspect of it, but the other one is that I actually do the handyman stuff, you know, that's why I accepted the the position to work there. So mm -hmm. I can stay connected. Balance it out, yeah. And I can do the like the recovery classes and I do, you know. Um what's going on with your dad? What's going on in your relationship with your father? He actually just started like conversating with me again. He was putting me on no talk for a while. You, you know blame him? No. I is he here him. in the city? No, he's coming. He's he's still in Alaska. He's coming back. Um, uh, I'm working on it. Yeah, I'm working. No, on it, it takes time for sure. Liz loves cats. You know, I'm a cat person too. I guess so. If we're at Phoenix and see all these cats walking the neighborhood. So we've been taking care of them, and they come around us. Oh, you old okay. You just got to let her eat first, man. Remember, she let you pet her when you are done, when she was done. Yeah. They're animals that are outside struggling. It would just kill me if anything happened to them. It's just the right thing to do, help something that can't really help itself. You don't see it too often, where two people meet up and go through this whole journey together, coming out of the mud. I told her, if we can weather all the stuff that's going on now, we'll be unstoppable when we leave. I've been in Cook County 17 times, mostly for uh, possession, simple possession or uh, retail theft and the experience going through here. I'm not sure if the punishment fits the crime. There's no level of jail, you know, it's jail period. So however you would expect uh, Jeffrey Dahmer or, you know, uh, John Wayne Gacy, you're getting treated the same way. It's meant to be a deterrent but it becomes more of, this is what I'm worth. The self-esteem level and what it does to you mentally, it gives you a feeling of hopelessness that just perpetuates the cycle of the revolving door of coming in and going out. I understand why it's meant to be harsh and it's not meant to be something that's fun or easy. 
I just think there should be more programs for people to help you realize that what you did and the thought patterns behind it are not conducive to a healthy lifestyle. I have, I think, like 49 cents in the bank. I'm pretty much surviving off of the generosity of the taxpayers with my link card for food. Having the celiac and having to eat everything gluten-free makes that super challenging because gluten-free food is very expensive. I struggle with that. It's a hopeless feeling, but I'm trying to stay as positive as I can and small accomplishments are big wins. Staying at Phoenix House, you're limited to what you can do. There's quite a few requirements to get off of restriction but the benefits that come with it are when a single man room is available, you get moved into that. You kind of get your freedom back. They're not watching you as closely as they were when you were on restriction. Brand new room, just got it yesterday. Still got that new car smell. Had to clean it profusely. One of the requirements is you have to be self-sufficient. They help you with laundry money and bus passes while you're on restriction so you can get to your appointments and um, clean your clothes. Uh, so now that I'm off of it, I'm responsible for a little more on my end of paying for things. It's a big step. It's a big step and everybody notices it and you, you feel it too because it took a lot of work to get there. We cover everything in this group from conflict resolution, anger management, all the way to financial literacy, which is where we're in the middle of right now. Okay, so two weeks ago, we started um, understanding your credit, a little bit with credit cards, and we're gonna wrap up hopefully today, but we ask a lot of questions and there's a lot of talk. When you go for an apartment, they do credit checks and they do background checks. So the credit score is something that I can improve upon. And we talked about how to get your credit report. So now let's move into credit repair. If there is something on there that you think is not accurate, either you paid it off already, or it's absolutely wrong, or it wasn't you, you can dispute every single item on your credit report. Now they may come back and ask you for proof, Right? What do you have to back up that you paid this? Do you have receipts? What do you got? If I can attain to have good credit, even with a bad background, it should, you know, hopefully neutralize any worries that they might have when I, I go to try and get an apartment. All right, thank you guys. <laughs> Kind of, it's kind of weird going to a police station after, you know, being incarcerated, but not so much today because I, I haven't done anything and I'm doing something positive, so. Today I'm coming for the second time to try and get my fingerprints taken for my rap sheet so I can get my expungement, apparently. They only do fingerprinting on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Hi, how are you? Have you been arrested by Chicago Police? Uh, yes, sir. The today's going to be $16. You'll pay that after you get printed. OK. You just fill out this top section of this form. The case where I went to prison was for retail theft. That one can't get expunged, but it can be sealed. 
So the difference is uh, they're not going to see it on a background check unless they do a background check where I have to get fingerprinted. And if it does show up, it will show it as sealed, which tells the person looking at it that I have moved on with uh, my life and I'm not committing those offenses. It'll show initiative on my part that I'm trying to change. So hopefully whoever's making the decision, be it the apartment place or the job, uh, to give me a second chance. It was a little more nerve wracking than I thought it was gonna be. Um, now I just gotta wait seven to 10 days to get my rap sheet from Chicago. Then my next step is going to Cabrini Green Legal Aid and uh, filing with the Cook County Circuit Court. And then I'll get a court date and go to court and hopefully that'll be it. Uh, big day today, graduating from AMB. Me and my Both sweetheart, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just to think that uh, two months ago we were Living in sleeping a tent. in a tent. <laughs> it was really hard to get in the treatment. I got a surprise for you, too. <laughs> Do you get the ring? Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow, babe. Wow. It's a promise ring. Oh, wow. So, because we graduated and things are going really good, oh, wow. so I want to get you a ring? promise ring. Oh, yeah. Oh, that fits perfect. Yeah. You did good. You did good, babe. <laughs> the moon rock that yeah. we talked about? Aw. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, but, thank you, babe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I do too. Oh. Oh, did you get me on? <laughs> uh oh. Smudged you with makeup. Welcome, everybody, to our once a month graduation. <laughs> we get to see people here on their first day, okay. we get to see people here completing. We get to see people who've been here for five years, who still come back because they're part of this family. This family doesn't end the day that you complete your program. And this day really just marks a, a transformation and marking really hard work that you've put in. All right, let's give it up for Miss Elizabeth Parker. <laughs> I still remember the I still rem <laughs> I still remember the first day coming here. I had a fold up chair with me and a lot of luggage because I didn't know where I was gonna sleep at night. And above and beyond helped me find a recovery home. I'm very grateful to be at. Thank you everybody. Kyle Hilbert. Thank you. It's, it's amazing to see this right now because, you know, two months ago I was hopeless, irritable, and discontent living in a tent uh, <laughs> with all my stuff, nowhere to go, and it was, it was really hard. Uh, like a lot of people said, you know, my family's not really talking to me that much, and my dad's in Alaska, so I'll send him a picture and see if I get a phone call this you know, today. I'm hoping for that. Uh, this is my first time getting through this with a partner. So, you know, the fact that uh, both of us are graduating today is, is pretty special. Uh, yeah, I'm just very grateful to be here, and I will definitely keep coming back. Thanks, guys. Graduating above and beyond signifies that I'm growing in my recovery and that I'm 
getting ready to start moving on to the next levels of getting ready to be out on my own. You good? I'm so proud of you, brother. <laughs> it's your turn. Well, thank you. It's not only important to myself, but to my family and other people that see that I've taken the initiative to get treatment and help for myself that wasn't court mandated or for some other reason other than me wanting a better life for myself. My dad responded back to my text. I sent him a picture of me graduating and let him know. I hope he's doing okay. I look forward to seeing him. And I finally got a response back because he wasn't wasn't talking to me for a while. And he texted me back, always pleased to hear you're doing better and hope and pray that you can finally start living a normal life in all capital letters and be happy and healthy for the rest of it. There's still a lot of hard work ahead and a lot of obstacles that I'm going to face. Knowing what I know, I won't say for sure that nothing bad is going to happen because, you know, it probably will. And it usually does. But I got too much going for me now. I got no reason to give this up. <laughs>